So yeah, this is uh, this is the presentation, and then we are going to jump into code, and then we're going to go back to the presentation. Uh, it's basically about a product that was created by Databricks at the beginning of the year. It was called the Live Tables, and uh, yeah, it's it's quite an inspirational piece of work uh, since it tries to simulate or replace ETLs uh, in Azure Data Factories at least. Uh, Maybe if I turn my camera off, I will be having more performance in my computer. So uh, now it's off. <laughs> but yeah, this talk is about Delta Live tables. Uh, all right, so this is myself. Uh, I just wanted to introduce myself because nobody, uh, not everybody uh, knows me here. My name is Fernando. I work for Arinti, which is a consultancy company that works for Unilever. And at Unilever, I work as a data engineer uh, so far. And we are always helping uh, Unilever uh, with our consultants. So we've been working for, I think, five years now or something like that. Um, all right. So the agenda for today is to talk about a bit about uh, Delta Live tables, because I don't think that everybody knows them. Probably some people have heard of it, but uh, not we're really working it uh, so i would like to actually start from the beginning and uh, give a definition for it uh, and then jump into code and say how can we get started how can we get our hands dirty a bit and with some kind of uh, demo and then we can jump into a project or a pipeline that i work it was a proof of concept that was supposed to actually do a lot of things uh, but yeah we, we will jump into into it and uh, at the end uh, I will I will just uh, give some conclusions about it and probably future work all right so data engineering is normally presented as this uh, beautiful kind of uh, yeah pipeline where things are floating from uh, different layers uh, and this is what normally people use to have like bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Everything is starting from this left side. So you have raw data that goes through all the layers. And then at the end, there is some added value uh, with some kind of dashboard like Power BI dashboard or Tableau dashboards or even some data science or yeah, ML DevOps or something that it's producing, uh, let's say, uh, this is value, right? And with each of these layers, the quality of the data is supposed to be improving. Uh, but the problem is that it's not as, as simple as that. Uh, or, yeah, I mean, there could be quite a lot of complexity in those steps. Since there are a lot of technologies that are basically yeah, working together in order to create that business value uh, in analytics. Uh, so that's why Databricks basically uh, tries to break these things down and build abstraction layers on top of it. So you don't have to, you know, manipulate AWS Glue, for example. This is uh, AWS um, Cloud, for example, uh, or data doc for doing your data quality or you want to do orchestration with airflow or no you don't want to do airflow but you want to use something else so this there are there are a lot of complexities and things floating around and uh, that's what the databricks try to actually uh, create for you like yeah all these layers can be encapsulated into new pieces of technologies that can be delivered for for data engineers or data scientists or whatever that people are, are trying to use uh, for creating this business value. Um, and there is where uh, data life tables actually come into play. Uh, since they try to actually uh, create ETL pipelines in a more automatic way. If you search for a definition of Delta life table, uh, you can find in your workflow workflow sorry um, that there is a like yeah it's a declarative approach uh, to creating ETL pipelines and managing infrastructure 
And those are the things that uh, that actually sell this product that is pretty much automatic. So things like clusters or workers and so on, auto scaling is also handled for you. So there are a lot of things that are going on that are made for you. And uh, they also, the, the complexity of of this thing, like, uh, you know, saying how everything needs to be computed, how you need to do your data quality, etc. In, uh, in a declarative way, which is also quite simpler since you say what you want to compute and not how you compute it. Uh, it is also supposed to be more reliable in data since they give something called expectations. So these expectations are basically uh, data quality checks and you can you can fail the pipeline if those quality checks fail or are not met. Or you can just delete the rows that are not meeting your, your expectations. I mean, there are different options you can think of in these ETL pipelines or new frameworks. I mentioned here that there are three major concepts uh, and that those concepts are related with code basically and yeah, they always need to be present into the head of the coder or the person who is writing the pipeline. So the first concept is that uh, you have functions that contains decorators and these decorators uh, slash functions assume that the return value is going to be a data frame. And as far as it's always the data frame, uh, the DLT will be okay with it. Uh, the second concept is that uh, you can add like uh, quality checks or uh, yeah expectations on top of those functions, uh, and that's something nice to have uh, in order to delete rows that you don't want and or even columns that you don't want. And in that way, you build trust in your data. And the third concept is that there is uh, th there is this lineage of tables that will be, yeah, we will see it later on. But there is like a dependency between tables. Uh, we will be, uh, yeah, creating, uh, and that will be your pipeline actually. So. Uh, This is where, sorry, this is where the data life tables leave, basically in the data engineering part of the lake house. So the DataRix lake house uh, platform is basically the foundation for data engineering and data life tables leaving this spot. All right. Um, one of the things or differentiators of the DLT tables uh, is that they can have the flavor of SQL, but they can also have the flavor of Python. So you have the possibility of creating both and even both at the same time in the same pipeline. Uh, in this example, uh, we're using something called a streaming live table that is based on cloud files. Cloud files is something that underneath uh, works with auto loader which i'm going to explain in the next slide but uh, basically what it means is that it detects if new files are arriving in your landing zone and if they do if they do then uh, they are added to your to your process or they are consumed one of the things that are interesting and uh, also they sell uh, for the ot product is that there is auto automatic schema evolution so that means that if there are new columns that are being added to your files or there are more rows or yeah whatever you have new uh, that schema needs to uh, is going to be uh, replaced or changed and there will be uh, logs about it as well so that will help with observability which we will be, which which we which we will see later on great uh, so this is what i was Talking about the auto loader, uh, so the, basically the auto loader is is uh, is a way to consume files in a way that you don't have to. You don't need to have like 
uh, a list of all the files and then see what's new and then if it's something new you consume it and if there is nothing new you don't do anything or you just ignore it so that's what i mean with this uh, table here so if you have a bunch of files that are arriving to your landing zone and then only one is new you don't need to read all the thing the whole thing and you know see what's new see what is not new and so on uh you can just read one file and then you read what is new only with the autoloader uh let's say uh deployment and this happens automatically and this yeah automatically add the new columns or whatever you have in the new file uh so that's actually something nice for or from the cloud files uh, that we saw previously here in this query. What this query is doing is basically, um, yeah, selecting everything from, from this particular uh, path, sales orders, and then doing some uh, configurations about it. Uh, but yeah, it's using the autoloader stuff that it's in here. You can choose, uh, if you want to have notifications about the the files that you're reading, so for example, if you are reading a new file, uh, you can have notification about that as well. So, but you need to configure that in your yeah in your mapping, All right? So great. So now the the dependency in the the creative SQL happens. Uh, when you basically create, let's say, a raw table, and then you treat that raw table as a, as a part of your from in, in your bronze layer. And in that way, uh, DLT establish a dependency between this table called bronze and this table called raw. The name of the table is always the name that you put in here. And the same will happen with uh, with Python code. We will see that uh, in the example in the demo. Uh, but yeah, as you, all that I want to say here is that you have a dependency that is being passed from from uh, from raw to bronze, and then bronze is used in silver as well. So in this table in silver, the DLT knows that it depends on bronze, and that bronze depends on raw. And in that way, you create a, a lineage of tables. And that lineage of tables, in the end, will produce your, your flow of data that will give you the pipeline itself. Uh, great. So as I mentioned previously, uh, there is this schema evolution that uh, works with Opsert. And that means that every time there is a new column that has been added or yeah, the schema changes, let's say uh, an integer for a string or something like that, then that schema is uh, is safe and it evolves in a way that, yeah, that those new changes are taken into consideration. So there's a schema evolution for, the, for all the data sources that you have. You can have streaming data sources and you can also have like uh, processing by batches. Uh, so there are the two flavors as well. I mean, it's it's uh, quite complete. Uh, yeah, for the for the data quality checks, um, you can establish these expectations. In here is is shown as a constraint, but we will see that this is actually uh, an expectation. I mean, the, the expectation is what you are trying to to filter out. So in this case, for example, in the table uh, fire account raw, there is supposed to be a column that is called DT, and this column shouldn't be null. And if it's null, then uh, you drop it. So if this expectation is not met, you drop that row. Same as with this, uh, this other expectation. So the DT column should be bigger than the ADT column. Uh, and if none of this is uh, is met, then you just drop the row and and you have uh, you know a, a cleaner table. And uh, in some point we will we are going to see that there is 
yeah, this kind of little dashboard so you can build that tells you like how many drop rows you had uh, uh, for which column and so on. So it will tell you information about the data quality that you just perform. And as I mentioned previously, you can have streaming live tables, or you can also have normal uh, Delta live tables, or you can have Delta live uh, views as well. So you don't need to materialize for a table itself. You can just use a view. And that makes your pipeline faster, by the way. Uh, one of the things that that were uh, important at the, at the moment for um, designing DLTs was actually the observability of the pipeline. Uh, since this was actually something that uh, is always taught at the end of the, any uh, software product, right? So you at the end is when you when you think about this uh, observability, and then you need to refactor a lot of things. But in Delta Live tables, it was not like that. Um, so that's something great from DataRix because they thought in creating this visualization of the pipeline, in which you can you can even refresh a specific parts of it, and you don't need to refresh the whole thing. Uh, but yeah, observability also means that you know uh, when the pipeline is running and uh, and when that piece of software is, is actually executing. And monitoring is something that is a bit different, uh, but it's based on observability. Monitoring means for Databricks that the, the data that there, there is being fetched by the observability is uh, yeah, it's manipulated in, in a dashboard, for example, or yeah, any kind of other tool that you can consume. Um, so that's that's something that, that that is kind of kind of nice uh, from from data rigs. All right, uh, these are the kind of things that you can uh, do for observability. For example, you can you can do this dashboard uh, for 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 a sales data in which tells you how many rows were ingested. Um, yeah, all this information that is being used by the pipeline. And this information, by the way, is also in the JSON formats. Uh, but this is nicely represented. This was uh, fetched by Sara, by the way. And thank you, Sara. It helps a lot for visualiza visualizing uh, what this is about. Um, one of the last things about Delta Live tables is uh, the workflow with orchestration. So one of the, yeah, when you work with Microsoft, for example, uh, yeah, everything is interconnected, right? So all the tools can speak with each other. That's what makes, uh, I think, Microsoft so powerful. But uh, it also happens with Databricks as well. So everything uh the orchestration can be done uh, through uh, jobs for example or through airflow or yeah azure data factory or other uh, technologies as well so it's quite flexible in a way that it can be integrated with other other clouds even not only microsoft cloud but it can be also aws and if i'm not mistaken also google cloud um, so this pipeline can be, you know, it can be part of a, of a process uh, or a bigger process. We will see an example of this uh, Databricks jobs that can trigger the pipeline itself. Okay, so any questions about the theory? All right, so I'm going to jump into code. Uh, right. Um, so I created this demo um, with Delta Live tables, and this is what I wanted to to show you guys uh, and everybody. So, for example, in here, you are importing a DLT, and this is a, a library that uh, 
you cannot just run like a normal command. So if you come here and then try to run it, this will fail saying to you like, OK, I don't know what the OT is. And I think that DataRix is working on it, uh, but I'm not sure. So the, the thing is that this is not the correct uh, way of just running a command, just like you're used to it, because you need to actually run it from the workflow, which is somewhere here. So we will see that, that later. Uh, so in here, you have the decorator I was mentioning, and uh, this is the function that follows. And as you can see, it returns a data frame. She's happy as far as she returned always the data frame. And in here is creating a view, so it's not materialized as a table. And in this case, it's different. So he creates a table that is based on uh, that is using the cloud files, which is uh, the one that with the auto loader that I mentioned previously. And he is uh, he's defining the schema like this and with this kind of format. And he's yeah reading from this path orders, which is a path I define here. Um, and then he will create its uh, we will create this table, uh, which is called sales orders raw. The name of the table can be passed by default, which is the name of the function, but you can also type here something like name and then pass a, you know, some name that you want to have, like a name or whatever you want. But by default, it takes the name of the function. Uh, so in this case, it could be sales raw, sales orders raw. Uh, then as, as next table, you can have uh, this one, which will be handling expectations. Um, and we are saying here that the order number is not null um, as one of the expectations. But you can also say, uh, you know, expect or drop, or you can have the expect or fail. And this, fail, this would fail the pipeline, or you can just have an expectation and don't do anything about it as well. And in this expectation, uh, sorry, in this function, you are reading from another delta table. And in here, it, it establishes the lineage between the tables. So he knows by this dlt.read that he needs to first execute this one, which is the previous table, and then he will execute this sales orders clean. If you see these functions here, you feel like you're trapped to return a value always, uh, and that's it. But actually, you can put logic in, inside the function and then just return a data frame. In this case, it's just cleaning some stuff, like uh, some, some column names and so on, and uh, doing some, uh, yeah, aggregation, I think, uh, with some Unix uh, for the daytime and so on. Um, and the last table that it creates, it reads uh, it reads from the sales orders clean, which was the previous table. Um, and then do some aggregation uh, of the data, and then returns the data frame. So, which data is this? Uh, I created this uh, notebook that basically. It's reading, uh, it's reading data from somebody who, you know, put it uh, available data in GitHub, and and it's data about about sales and customers, and basically what what's happening. Sorry, uh, what's happening in this notebook is that we are iterating um, over over these files over the over the sales orders of JSON, and then uh, kind of simulating what a streaming does, which is saving one row um, in, the, in, in the database. So basically what it will do is just, it will go here to the, to the JSON yeah, file, and then for every line in that JSON, it will introduce that into the database that I will be passing here. And then this 
database uh, with this table will be read in this file uh, when it passes sales order sales order raw with this autoloader. So in that way, we're going to be doing some kind of streaming. Uh, and that's why you have this read stream here, by the way. Whereas in the other file, this is just a static kind of thing. And then you can just read it once and you don't have to, uh, let's say, do this streaming, but you can just read it as a CSV table. All right. So what I'm going to do is just to execute this. Oh, the cluster was down. Oh, my bad. So I'm just going to try to quickly do it. Um, and how do we execute this uh, little demo is uh, basically you need to go to workflows. Um, oh, come on. So that would be here. And then in workflows, you need to create a new pipeline. And in, then this will be shown to you, which is basically uh, a UI for, for setting your new pipeline. Uh, there are quite some interesting things here. Uh, and the first thing that you need to think of is that this is not a, a prison in which you are obligated to do stuff that is only listed here. You can also go to the JSON format and just edit this and add as many yeah, things in your dictionary as you want. So the configuration is completely up to you, but this is the minimum that they actually require. And in here they have the product edition, which is core, pro and advanced. And these are just three tiers that depend uh, on what you want or what are your needs. So if you actually open this help me choose. Uh, you will see that there are the three tiers and depending on what you choose, you can have uh, one or more things. So, for example, if you have the DLT advanced, you can have uh, data quality expectation rules or policies, observability, uh, which will help you to create dashboards and the forum performance for the your SQL. So this will be all included in your advanced where, where it is in the core. You can only have the basic stuff. And in the pro, you have a little bit more. So you can have this uh, CDC, uh, but only that. All right. So, but we we want to keep advanced so we can have our quality check. We can have our quality checks. It is just a name, so I'm going to call demo DLT. Uh, demo DLT is fine. Um, and then in here, you need to point to the notebook that you created. Uh, where's my network? So it should be here. It's this guy. Now, the target is your database. So this will be executing, right? And this will be creating Delta Live tables, but the, those Delta Live tables will be saved on their some database. And in my case, I chose, I chose this one because it's the same as uh, it's the same uh, name of the database I created. The storage location is something that you don't need to fill in and it will be created for you once you click create. But basically what it is, is a storage location in your file system that tells you the tables that were created, uh, the content of the table and some metadata about it like uh, what, um, how many rows does it have, uh, some of the data quality expectations, and so on. So metadata about the tables itself is stored in there. Uh, trigger mode and continuous mode is basically, um, yeah, batch or, or streaming. Uh, and enable outscaling is something nice because you don't need to create a, a cluster for this. So basically, they they create a cluster for you. They know when the cluster needs to scale up or down, depending on the workload that uh, the pipeline is having at certain period of moment. So this is uh, this is all managed for you, same as the amount of workers that you have. Um, 
if you want to use photon acceleration, this is uh, a bit more expensive, but what it does is to help you to, yeah, uh, have faster SQL queries. Okay, so I'm going to create this and uh, then we're redirected to this, um, this page in which you have uh, all these options here. Um, if you want to modify your settings again, you just need to click here. And in here is some basic information about the pipeline. Um, so if you click just start, it will start to, um, yeah, to try to execute this notebook that is being passed here. And now we have more information in this panel. So that means that there is a cluster that will be created for you. And you can check that. You can go and check uh, the Spark UI. You can, if you want, you can create, you can go to the metrics uh, thing. And uh, well, right now it's not there, but normally here you have a ganglia stuff where you can check, uh, like, you know, how the clusters are doing, how the workers are performing. And you can also check other things like costs and so on. So this is all created for you. And in that way, it's quite automatic. Um, but this will take a bit of time. And while we wait here, I would suggest to, or I would like to go to the, uh, to the other pipeline that I created. So the proof of concept as mentioned previously. Um, which is also a Delta, a Delta Live table pipeline. So um, just go back to the workflow. Uh, so the, the pipeline I created was this one. It was called Venus Alpha. And this was a proof of concept for a pipeline that, uh, that, is, that is called NRM. Um, and basically it's just a pipeline from Unilever that uh, handles things like sales or products or markets in different countries. Uh, in our case, it was Hungary, Poland, uh, yeah, and countries from the, from the East Europe part, uh, Greece and Romania, sorry. Right, so in this, pipeline, you can see that there are a lot of tables uh, in this part that are being synced into, into this other table. So this dependency, uh, yeah, of course, because we, we sync it, uh, we sync all these fact tables into this one. Um, and then that one is merged into another table in here and so on and so forth. So in this way, you can see that uh, there is a lot of dependencies going on. And that is because there is something in Delta Live table called patterns that allows you to, you know, create all these dependencies. So, so it's quite complex to, to know which tables depend on which. And that's why uh, we, in DLT, they created patterns. Right, because uh, so if we jump into code again, uh, this is in our repo. So it's DLT Venus Alpha. We have the three layers here. So silver, gold, and platinum. And we also have something called Watcher, which I will explain in a second. But let's just, let's just jump first into silver and see how those tables were created. All right, so, um, so in this script, I have uh, a base URL, which is basically uh, the place where all the Delta tables are. And then um, in the logic, I will be jumping into Hungary group, uh, Poland and Baltics, which is for Poland. Uh, this is the path for Romania and the path for Greece. And for each and every path, I'm going to subtract or try to create delta tables, delta live tables uh, for facts, markets, and products for each of the countries. 
So the way I do that is uh, is that basically um, I put everything inside of a function, and you can see that this is just a normal function. That we create the fact tables of every country. So what is inside this function is a DLT function uh, that should return a that should return a table. So depending on which country is it, it will return one thing or another. Um, and what I'm going to do is to iterate through this function and then pass the country and which table I'm talking about. And then depending on those, um, yeah, this function will execute a table that is not going to be called raw CDC, but it's going to be called the table name replacing the parentheses with underscore and replacing the parentheses with underscore. So this will be the table name. So for example, um, uh, well, I cannot execute this because it will be quite long, but uh, yeah, if you have a table name that is called like the other ends or HU the, the other ends in here, when I pass that table name, that's what is going to be created. So the Delta Life table would be called Hungary uh, deodorants or detail or whatever. Uh, right. So this is the iteration through all the countries. So if you have a Hungary country, you will use the Hungary path. And uh, well, in here is uh, transactional, which means which means that we're going to be using uh, this kind of tables. And then you specify, you extract the table name. You append it and, and then you you call the function create detail tables, which was a previous function. And this will create um, all the fact, the factual data for Hungary. The same would happen with Poland, Romania and Greece. And uh, and then, you know, all this. Oh, let me see if I can come back. Yeah, all this factual data uh, will be created. So these are the things like uh, this is Poland cooking products detail, and this is basically the the factual data. OK, um, same pattern can be executed uh, as many times as you want. And this is basically uh, traversing through all the factual data. And then I want to sync it into one into one table, which is doing this part. So all these things, um, all these tables, that the live tables will be synced into this one table. Um, and in that way, it, we can produce a pipeline that we want. So what we do is to basically iterate through all of them. Um, and then append them in a huge data frame and after all, uh, you will be union every single data frame and then returning that as a result. Um, and this creates basically your, let's say, golden fact, but it's, yeah, it's something in the middle. It's not really golden table, but uh, it's going in between silver and, and gold. And in that way, I can keep going on and, uh, you know, keep applying my pattern and thinking into different tables and I will have a version of of uh, of silver. Then when that is done, I can I can go on and go to the golden uh, view and I can execute things like uh, logic that the, that is the gold logic, let's say. Um, so, for example, I can create dimensional uh, tables, uh, same as, as as you could do with your ADF uh, and and your notebooks, but encapsulating all the logic into into this pattern in which you have function and then you have the DLT table that returns a, a data frame. So, in here you can see that, for example, for Greece, which is a very special case for us. Uh, you will be uh, calling this function, which is create dimensional, but the pre-letter, which is using this query, 
it will be W because Greece is special. And if it's not Greece, then uh, everyone else is called R. So this is a way to encapsulate your, like your logic for gold in a table and uh, and then iterate through it. So this is a comment. Uh, sorry, I didn't clean this, but uh, didn't have enough time. After all, you you can uh, you can continue and say and do the same for the factual data. Uh, you don't need to explain the whole logic of it because it will be boring. Uh, some aggregation and then uh, I think after after some commands, you will be having the product table. And the, I think the market was created somewhere else. Uh, so yeah, in this way you can you can continue with your let's say level of abstractions, and finally reach the platinum layer uh, in which you have you know like all these configurations uh, stuff that we normally have in platinum, and. Uh, and then you have a little bit of logic, but it's not that much uh, for our pipelines. So, for example, in here you're having create platinum team product because you want to create a product platinum version, and then you're going to iterate through all the countries. Um, yeah, same for for uh, this is some genetics that we're creating. Same for the markets uh, tables for all the countries, and then for the factual table, uh, which is not doing that much, to be honest, because all the logic was held into the gold layer. So in that way, you can create this huge pipeline, uh, which runs, uh, it runs when it needs to be run, and it runs under an hour, which is a big, big difference if you if we compare it with the ADF pipeline that we have, which runs on in eight hours or something like that, which is completely unacceptable, of course. And this could be an alternative for for the NRM team uh, to have something that can be run under an hour. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, when do we run this? Because uh, you can schedule this. If you click here and then you add a job, this is what I was mentioning previously about you know the integration with other things that can execute your pipeline. You can just add a schedule and then trigger this every day or whatever you want every week if you want to. But one of the advantages actually from DLTs is that you can trigger when you need to. So that means that if one of these files change. So let's say that uh, in here I have a new table. So this PLD on detail change and the factual data change. And they add a new column, they add more rows or whatever. So then the pilot needs to be triggered, but only then. Uh, so what I did for achieving that was to create this watcher uh, notebook that is also inside my repo and it's at the same level of the other layers. And this watcher, he runs every morning. And what he does is that he goes through, he first calculates all the columns, all the, all the tables that he needs to check. So here is all the factual data for Hungary, mar uh, market data for Hungary and product data from Hungary, but the same with the whole other countries such as uh, Poland, Romania, and Greece. And then he calculates that, and then he knows, OK, these are all the tables I need to track. I need to keep an eye in those. Um, this is just uh, you know, the, the paths and so on. And then um, he creates, well, he takes information of the pipeline, like what is the pipeline ID, uh, what is the domain of the pipeline, because he wants to trigger it if it's necessary. Uh, these are helper functions, uh, blah, 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 and uh, and what he does is basically at the end. So these are more helper functions. So 
Yeah, there is a JSON file that is having the information. Sorry, I I need to go back a bit. Yeah, there is a JSON file that is uh, that is having the information of all the tables that that he calculated previously that he needed to track, and he's keeping the version of the of the delta table. So then, if he uh, if he check again in here, uh, he will be comparing the new information uh, of the table with the with the information that that he lost. So so the the information of the JSON file will be compared with the information of the new table. So if if it's the same version, for example, I know I don't have to trigger the pipeline, so I don't trigger anything. But if the versions are different, then I I detect a change, and then I can see. Okay, uh, let's see which version is uh, are we talking about, and if I need to trigger the refresh or not, and which kind of refresh is this a merge or is it an override? So these are things that you are able to track, and you're able to you know uh, detect and and calculate. So if you have a refresh uh, or you need to trigger an update, depending on if it's a merge or not, uh, you basically trigger the pipeline through this function, which is called run and poll. So if I go back, here's the definition of the function where I basically say, uh, okay, I know I have to trigger the pipeline and Therefore, I'm going to try to do it with the information of the pipeline itself that is was created here. So with this information, you can know which pipeline are you talking about and where you need to trigger it. So in this function, all that it has to do is to basically do that. Um, so she will call the pipeline and then this will start running. Uh, without any kind of scheduler or you know if it doesn't ha if it doesn't need to run you just don't run it which is great because it can save you a lot of money uh right because in the cluster if you normally in adf what you do is to put a job or something and and then that job will trigger every day for example but that's not the case here so i think that's one of the greatest things that you can do with dlts now this notebook is a schedule, so he will run every day. So there is a job that will trigger this notebook every day at uh, at 6:27 a.m. Um, and if it if it's uh, if it's if it needs to be successful, if it needs to be uh, triggering the pipeline, it will do it. And if it doesn't have to, it, it will just exit and uh, you know no harm done in fact i can just try to do something like run uh, but uh, yeah attach and run um and then at the end it will be saying like uh, you know watch your finish without any update because he didn't need it to trigger the pipeline and normally this is what you what you can have at the end you can also uh, you know configure this to have some kind of email uh, that will be forward to you if the pipeline is triggered and so on. Uh, but if, yeah, this is also a way of, of doing that. And Fernando, just, I think um, eventually yeah. this will be part of DLT. Uh, like right now you have all this code, but yeah, yeah it's, part of the, it's part of the roadmap that this will just be part of uh, DLT. So hopefully yeah. it should get easier going forward, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, indeed. Uh, so that's that's quite uh, quite nice, actually, because we asked for it uh, to Databricks, to you guys, and you were uh, you you gave us a Q4, I think, for this year to having this feature released. That's one of the things, actually, I really like uh, of Databricks is that uh, people can come to you guys and say, hey, I want this feature because I think it's useful, and then you guys do it. That's that's quite, uh, quite
quite nice. So for example, this select tables for refresh, what it does is that you can manually, uh, so if you click there, for example, I want to re just refresh like these tables. Um, and I, I can just do it manually and then click refresh selection and it will, it will just refresh those two tables. So that's that's something that somebody asked for it, uh, and then they did it, and now it's there. And the same will be with the with the watcher that I created. The watcher was a way around, or a workaround, let's say, uh, to have this uh, feature, because I I think it was important for the and the renting. Um, and finally, let's see if the pipeline. Uh, okay, so this pipeline was created here. This is the, the demo, basically the, the getting started uh, with it. And in here, there are some interesting things I wanted to show you, which was the data quality. Uh, so in here, you can see that this was the table, if I remember correctly, uh, or was it this one? Oh, I need to check the code. Um, so, Sales order draw was not, it was sales order clean. Let's see that one. And yeah, so it was this one actually. Uh, and in here, there is like the data quality stuff. So apparently everything was nice and nothing needed to be dropped. But this information is also here uh, in a JSON format. So if you see the logs, give me a second. So this is like materialized view, um, but there should be, maybe it's there. Yeah, so in this JSON format, you can see the, that is the definition details, there was properties, all the schema, uh, and then you can see a section of expectations. So normally there is more information here, but it didn't, it, it didn't need to drop anything. Uh, so yeah, but you can you can uh, create uh, some kind of dashboard, as I mentioned in the slides, that uh, they will be looking like that, and what this dashboard is doing is just to look at the logs and then put it in nice numbers that you can track and monitor whatever you want to. <sighs> All right. Um, so that would be basically it. Uh, some of the conclusions that I have for my work is that DLTs are basically uh, the, the best way of doing things uh, for ETLs at the moment because they have these new things that are, yeah, I think fantastic. For example, the expectations are quite nice. It helps you build trust in your data. It helps your business as well, because yeah, things run quite fast, but you can add business value uh, easily since things are automatically. Um, and that's the second conclusion I have, uh, which is basically do through automation and you know, this uh, not handling clusters uh, by yourself helps quite a lot. Uh, and finally, I I really liked uh, the scheme evolution. So it shows like uh, really cutting edge technology, really uh, better technology for data engineering because we can add more data value or more business value, sorry, uh, without worrying about all this uh, technology floating around. Uh, right, so I think that that would be my collaboration with uh, with you guys and with uh, with Unilever as well. So if somebody have questions, uh, feel free to contact me, or yeah, just just chat with me in, in Teams or or whatever. That's that's awesome, Fanda. I think uh, you're definitely doing my job, <laughs> um, and you, you did really great work. Um, so yeah, Thanks. nice work. And there's some questions in, in the chat. So um, Ayan and Saurav, 
are asking, um, was it eight hours running through ADF in Databricks or was it fully ADF that was that that it took eight hours? Uh, fully ADF, yeah. Fully ADF, okay. All right, awesome. All right, so is there any questions or comments or worries? I mean, I, I answered a lot of the questions whilst you were chatting, so uh, that's probably why people have run out of questions. Um, but yeah, I see we're at time. Uh, thank you again, Fernando. Honestly, like, great job. Um, Thanks. And yeah, we'll speak to you all soon. All right, see you, everyone. All right, see you guys. Cheers.